Namaskar. A very good evening, everyone. On behalf of Vivekananda Study Circle, JNU India, we welcome you all to this webinar for the panel discussion on a very interesting topic, Consciousness, Perspectives from Science and Vedanta by Swami Sarvapriyananda. We will start today's session with a recital of Vedic chanting from Taitriya Upanishad, a part of Yajur Veda. So now I would request Dr. Prachi Singh to kindly recite the Shanti Mantra. So Prachi, over to you. I thought you will be translating it actually. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you, Prachi. Now I request Dr. Alpita Mitra to kindly introduce today's speaker and the chair as well. So, Alpita Di, over to you. A very good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of VSC, I extend a warm welcome to our speaker, uh, Rivet Swami Savapriyanandaji, our chair, Professor Jaydeep Bhattacharya and all the distinguished guests who have joined us from across the world. Uh, Swamiji needs no introduction. He's the minister and spiritual leader of Vedanta Society of New York since 2017. He's a Nagral Fellow 2019-20 at the Harvard Divinity School. Prior to this, he served as assistant minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. And before that, he was Acharya of the Monastic Probationers Training Center at Belun Mat. Welcome, Swamiji. The talk will be chaired by Professor Jaydeep Bhattacharya, who is Professor of Psychology and Director of Research in the Department of Psychology at Goldsmiths, University of London. He also leads the Departmental Research Group of Cognitive and Neuroscience. He is fascinated by the challenges to understand the ever-changing brain waves and the spectrum of complex behavior that makes us human. He has presented lectures to general audience on topics like meditation and the brain, mind wandering, and musical creativity. Before handing over the mic, I would just like to request everybody to keep their mics switched off at all times. Please type your questions in the chat box. Those who are watching us live on YouTube, uh, use the live chat box there. So we'll take up all the questions after the speaker has finished speaking. I now request Professor Bhattacharya to take on the mic. Let me unmute. Okay, thank you, Peter, for your kind introduction and also welcome to everybody uh, to this wonderful and also kind of very exclusive webinar on this, this topic of consciousness. Uh, I would not take too much of time because, because like me, I believe everybody is actually eagerly waiting to hear and hear from the Maharaj. So I will just tell you a little bit, one or two minutes, to kind of setting the context more from empirical science perspective. So 15 years back, so I think in 2005, the editors of the prestigious the scientific journal Science, they made a list of like 125 unsolved scientific questions and the editors thought these are could be solved but still not yet solved so one of the I think the first in the list is what is the universe made of and the second was what is the biological basis of of consciousness so consciousness we all have have a quite a strong personal 
associations because this is so intrinsic and experience kind of feels kind of so very own and also kind of kind of quite private to us and also to kind of to define who we are so on the other hand we also rarely notice as well as realize that this is still remains quite elusive as well as quite deeply mysterious so in a sense although the science has made an enormous or tremendous progress over the last i would say 100 years and now we are almost living in the age of unprecedented kind of insight into the brain functioning but still the topic of consciousness we are still kind of struggling uh, i would say rather scratching the surface because we still do not have we means the scientists have a very precise idea what is consciousness or what it does, why it evolved, or also how deep it is in the universe. So these are the fundamental questions. That's definitely uh, kind of, as I said, it still can remain elusive and, and without kind of, kind of taking further time, because I'm sure at the end, end of this webinar, we would have a much broader understanding of, of at least some of these deep kind of mysteries of consciousness where how we can learn from the ancient, ancient knowledge and also what can be still those knowledge can be applicable and can be kind of bridged together with the model empirical science. So with that, I would conclude and, and I would transfer the mic to Revered Maharaj. Thank you, uh, Professor Jaidi Bhattacharya, for those uh, introductory remarks. Uh, thanks to Dr. Arpita Mitra and all her colleagues. Um, thanks to the uh, Vivekananda Study Circle at uh, JNU New Delhi for having me this morning. Uh, morning here in New York, but of course evening uh, in New Delhi. Uh, so, uh, consciousness from the perspective of science and Vedanta. My initial idea was that uh, I would speak, obviously, from the perspective of Advaita Vedanta uh, and talk about the Advaitic uh, theory, uh, conception of consciousness, and make, make a few maybe uh, concluding remarks about the science of consciousness. Obviously, I cannot speak to the science of consciousness. I'm not a scientist. But what happened was just a few days ago, um, I think this, uh, this Tuesday or Wednesday, I heard this talk uh, given by Christoph Koch, who is the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute. He has written a new book, uh, the, the Feeling of Life Itself. The Feeling of Life Itself. And this book was launched, uh, I think it was, it was maybe last year probably, but he gave a book talk at the Harvard Bookstore and an online webinar, much like this one. So. I heard that and I was so fascinated, I decided to change my presentation, today's presentation entirely. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to begin with what uh, Christoph Koch said and then take it from there to Advaita Vedanta. So what is the, uh, or at least one of the leading contenders um, from the scientific perspective on consciousness? So one of the leading theories. Uh, the inf integrated information theory of uh, Tononi. Starting from there, how do we get to the Advaitic perspective on, on consciousness? Um, I see five big steps or five major steps we have to take. So on, the, uh, on this journey, we will also get to a better appre appreciation of what Advaita Vedanta has to say about consciousness. So that's it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next 25-30 uh, minutes is uh, starting with uh, the uh, latest in neuroscience uh, uh, or a scientific theory of consciousness from there to Advaita Vedanta in five steps. So the first step is what I heard from Christoph Koch, what he said. Um, so one of the, or maybe the leading contender for a scientific theory of consciousness is this integrated information theory, the IIT, um, proposed by Tononi and Christoph Koch subscribes to that. He's working with Tononi. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is the things I noticed in his uh, presentation. Um, first of all, here we have for the first time 
um, more or less mainstream uh, scientific theory. Professor Bhattacharya can tell us more about it. But the mainstream scientific theory which says that consciousness is all pervasive, that it is there in all, at least in all living beings, um, which is a big step forward, actually. Uh, it's on, only until recently scientists were telling us that in all probably there's consciousness only in human beings and the higher animals and the lower animals um, and plants certainly do not have consciousness. But the integrated information theory um, uh, predicts that there is there is some level of consciousness in all living beings, even down to, from what I could gather, down to maybe even bacteria or things like that. Um, in fact, he mentioned that, he said that, um, it's not that lower animals or you know one-celled organisms uh, are thinking uh, or have emotions or um, not like that. But he gave a good example of uh, temperature in outer space. He said it's tremendously cold in outer space, and yet it's not absolute zero. Uh, there is still uh, some degree of heat still is there. Similarly, in the tiniest of creatures. It's not that they have any kind of consciousness or awareness like we have, but some basal level of consciousness is predicted. Anyway, that's one takeaway from what I what I got from his talk, uh, that it is scientifically now not impossible um, to say or state that there could be consciousness in all, at least in all living beings. Um, the second thing which I took away from his talk was that... Um, the value of consciousness, the, for the first time, science is recognizing the value of consciousness. He said, see, consciousness is the most valuable thing that we have got. Um, if you, and these are his words, Christoph Koch's words, if you were to give me a billion dollars and tell me that, you know, in exchange for my consciousness, that could, I could still go on living as a zombie, uh, that the body would be there and everything would be there, but I'd just not be conscious and I would have a billion dollars, I would say no. Because without consciousness, I'm nothing. So you could have, lose a part of your body or even um, the, well, a person could have mental problems. But still, you are there as long as you are conscious. So consciousness is not one more thing. It's not one more interesting thing. It's not just a valuable thing. It is the most valuable thing in the universe without comparison. Nothing comes even close to the importance of consciousness for us. Why is that important? Um, uh, you know, uh, recently, uh, just a couple of years back, uh, I had this little conversation with Ned Block. He's one of the leading uh, philosophers of mind in the world today. And so he posed a rhetorical question. So th that was actually a colloquium about uh, Advaita Vedanta and the hard problem of consciousness at the NYU, uh, New York University. So he posed this rhetorical question that why is this problem so important after all? Uh, I mean, the body has so many activities going on in that. Uh, so uh, brain produces consciousness. Uh, so that's just one of the things that's happening in the body. Why is this of such great importance? He meant it rhetorically, of course. It is of tremendous importance, unparalleled importance. The third thing which I took away from his talk was uh, that... Uh, you know, the, the beginning, the scientists are now beginning to distinguish between consciousness and the other aspects of mental functioning. So, um, as Dr. Anil Seth in England said, uh, that you don't have to be smart to suffer. So, a mouse uh, is can feel pain, quite obviously, uh, but it's not particularly smart. Uh, the computer, deep blue. Um, in, in the IBM, you know, which defeated the chess master, is tremendously intelligent. And I and I see. I mentioned that particularly because I see an IBM scientist who actually works with uh, in that department with the deep blue and all. So the the uh, computer is tremendously intelligent uh, as far as behavior is concerned, and uh, the mouse is not so intelligent. And yet the mouse is conscious. You need to be conscious to suffer. But you don't need, so deep blue cannot suffer. It can beat a chess grandmaster, but it cannot suffer. Um, one more thing which struck me was that uh, somebody asked Christoph Koch, this uh, investigation into consciousness, how has it impacted you personally? So look, here is this cutting edge um, scientific theory and the proponent of that theory saying that 
over the years, as I've, be, I've begun to understand the dimensions of consciousness, what it is and how it is all pervasive, he says, I uh, cannot eat flesh anymore. I became a vegetarian. I cannot even kill an insect. He put it very poetically. He said, see, here, this flash of consciousness in this tiny creature, this insect. Uh, before this, he, uh, he used the words bookends. Uh, the bookends of consciousness. Before this, there's eternal darkness. After this, there's eternal darkness. In that, there is this tiny flash of consciousness in this little creature. How can I kill it? it it's so unique, so valuable, so tremendous. Now, what I mean is, from an Advaitic, these are the takeaways which are important for me from an Advaitic perspective. That an investigation into consciousness, as Professor Jayadeva Bhattacharya said, it is so personal, it cannot but fail to transform you. Uh, that consciousness is everywhere. Uh, that is a huge step forward. From an, I'm speaking entirely from an Advaitic perspective now. Uh, that consciousness is not the same as the functionings of the mind. Uh, intelligence, memory, creativity, those are different things. They can be replicated by machines. Uh, so he's right there in, in Boston. I think he's associated with MIT also, uh, Christoph Koch. So you have a variety of intelligent mach machines there which can replicate many aspects of our mental functioning. Yet, yet, the point he made was none of them are conscious, even close to consciousness. They do not have that inner first-person feeling we have. Okay, so that was Christoph Koch. That's step one for us. We have, to my understanding, at least four more steps to go before we reach the Advaitic understanding of consciousness. Where the, what's the next uh, marker? What's the next milestone? It is the hard problem of consciousness. Step two. The question we must pose is, is the so-called hard problem of consciousness. Uh, David Chalmers, as you know, uh, a famous uh, uh, Australian philosopher of mind. He's right now here in New York in the uh, NYU Mind Brain Consciousness Unit. Uh, he uh, is famous uh, for his hard problem, the, coining the term the hard problem of consciousness. What is the hard problem of consciousness? It's basically this. How can an objective thing like the brain, a, a physical entity like the brain, have an inner state like consciousness? Just consider it for a moment. Nothing in the universe um, has these two kinds of states. When we look at a, like a piece of uh, paper or notebook, it's just a notebook. There is no inner state, as far as we know, of how it feels like to be a notebook. Uh, there is no inner state of how it feels like to be this laptop. But there is an inner state of what it feels like to be you. The doctor or the scientist who can see you from outside, a body, can investigate the workings of your brain. The last thing that a neuroscientist can do, the finest and deepest level of analysis, is this tiny electrical activity going on in our neurons. That's it. There's nothing more that a scientist, not only technologically impossible, in principle it is impossible. That's the end you can do. And that's the last thing that you can do. And yet, in that body and in that brain, we are talking about uh, feelings and emotions and ideas and um, desires and understanding. Uh, all of this has a certain feel, internal feel. Uh, that is consciousness. Uh, that is the primary uh, evidence of consciousness. But there is no way. Where do, how do you make the jump from something like a, like a brain to this inner first person experience? I mean, last year I had the opportunity to study at Harvard University, one of the things I did was I took up a course on the philosophy of mind because it relates to what I um, study and teach. So I just wanted to get a good survey of all the work that has been done in recent times in, um, in consciousness studies. And by the way, the, the textbook which we read was actually edited by David Chalmers. <laughs> so there, very clearly, the whole field of the philosophy of mind has stagnated over the last hundred years. You know what it's all about. A couple of hundred years, a little more than that, Descartes spoke about the cogito ergo sum, that you cannot deny that you are a conscious being because I think, therefore I am. So he made this clear Cartesian split between mind and body. Mind and body, they are distinctly different things. And this naturally poses problems. How are the mind and body related? How do you resolve this dualism? How, so in this age of materialism and reduction, uh, materialistic reduction, 
the whole thrust has been to show how the brain produces consciousness or the brain produces mind. So a reductionist approach. All the papers that we read, all the papers, they, are, they cleanly fall into two categories. A group of philosophers trying to show how the mind and consciousness by extension are nothing but the brain. They are nothing but the brain or they are nothing but language. They are nothing but behavior. Something objective with the body. And another group of philosophers saying, sorry guys, it doesn't work. Um, showing what is the fault in this kind of reasoning. So Thomas Nagel's famous, uh, what is it like to be a bat or Chinese room experiment or Jackson's, uh, the, saw the color red for the first time and so on. All of these papers, those who are familiar with the field, they have, these are like standard uh, works there. They all try to show that the reductionist approach is not working. You have to ask the hard problem, that this question, how can the brain produce consciousness? No answer, not even the beginning of an answer so far. Now that does not mean there's no correlation. The whole science of the neuroscience of consciousness is a science of correlations. That, uh, uh, one second, I think my, my internet is acting up a little bit. I'm going to switch networks. I might freeze for a second. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry for the interruption. We have a lot of uh, connectivity problems. Okay. Um, so the whole science, the neuroscience of consciousness is a science of, of um, correlations. Seems to have frozen again. We can hear you both. We can hear you. Yeah, it got frozen again. Yeah, right. Uh, is this working now? It's working now. It's working. It's working now. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. Um, so uh, the whole science of, um, of uh, the neuroscience of consciousness is a, is a science of correlates. Uh, what you report, and that's correlated with uh, what's, what's going on about, uh, what's going on in the brain, the neuronal activity in the brain, the correlations between these two. And that's all that we are doing. I asked this question to Christoph Koch. So where do you stand on the hard problem of uh, consciousness? And he immediately said, no, we cannot go down that route because that would stop all kind of scientific investigation uh, into consciousness. I think he's wrong, but if you're interested why, in why I think he's wrong, we can take it up later in the question answers. But that's the second step. Consciousness cannot be reduced to the brain alone, though there is definitely strong correlation. Consciousness functions through the brain, but it is not a byproduct of the brain. It's not an epiphenomenon. So David Chalmers says, uh, he supports what is called panpsychism, that uh, there is consciousness is a fundamental reality of the universe. Just like time, space, matter, energy, there is a reality called consciousness. And uh, that, that interacts with uh, the uh, body, mind, with, with the brain. So that's the second step where we move from um, consciousness as part of a physical system to consciousness as an independent reality interacting with physical systems. Third step. Um, and the second step itself is something that was uh, uh, well known to, say, for example, ancient Sankhya, which considered consciousness and material universe, Prakriti and Purusha, to be uh, fundamental realities, not to be reduced to each other. So third step. The third step would be um, consciousness is not an objective phenomenon. Consciousness is not an object. Now here, we are behind uh, modern thought, science, modern philosophy. None of them seem to get this simple fact. It's not very difficult to understand, but absolutely no understanding uh, in uh, modern the science of uh, consciousness or in the philosophy of mind. It is continuously taken as an object. For very good reasons, um, all the uh, the study in all scientific endeavors so far has been focused on objects. But this 
this and so that's why the approach is to study something as an object uh, it it leads to sometimes ridiculous attempts in the in the study of consciousness for example christoph koch was talking about this studying consciousness in uh, octopuses for example now from an advaitic perspective that's so funny because consciousness is directly presented to you um, in your own personal first person experience why give that up and go looking for consciousness in octopuses uh, so what you will find there uh, is the material correlate of consciousness but consciousness in itself is only directly presented to each of us in our minds within ourselves never objectively outside so that consciousness is not an object in fact let me take a couple of minutes and tell you a story which will make the whole point clear there it's the famous old indian story of the 10th person that uh, the 10 persons go across uh, a river and then after crossing the river uh, they they think uh, uh, have we all crossed or did somebody drown and they start counting 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 where is the 10 person there are only nine each person when he counts he finds only nine people obviously he's not counting himself so they come to the conclusion that the 10th person is not there the 10th person drowned and they start crying and this wise man is walking past he asks why are you crying and they say sir we have crossed the river we have a 10 now we are only nine the 10th person has obviously drowned and we are sad and this man understands the problem and he says count the 10th person is still there i'll show i'll show you and they count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 we told you there are only nine people and this man comes and takes the hand of the counter and turns it around thou art the 10th dashamastvamasi that's the uh, in sanskrit thou art the 10th and this man realizes oh 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh the 10th person has been found that sounds like a silly story but it's very profound actually it really points to what is consciousness how does it do so why did the why did they miss the existence of the 10th person you will say because the counter was not counting himself true true but here is the real question why was the counter not counting himself where did he expect to find the 10th person he expected to find the 10th person out there why did he expect to find the 10th person out there because he found the nine people out there 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and therefore by that logic the 10th man must be standing there in the queue but the 10th man is not like the other nine the 10th man is the one who's counting exactly like that sankhya advaita vedanta um, it goes all the way back to the upanishads the kena upanishad they got this insight where is consciousness and by extension the conscious self it is not out there when you say pancha kosha vilakshana atma the self is distinct from the five sheets of the human personality the annamaya pranamaya manomaya vigyanamaya anandamaya it is a mistake to think that the atman is a sixth one apart from these five no 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 it is the one to whom these five are appearing the one which experiences all of these five avastatra vilakshana atma the witness of the three states of consciousness so in upanishad it is called the fourth the turiya it is not that there is a waking and a dreaming and a deep sleep and a separate pure consciousness one more a fourth thing no the deeper understanding of that is that one thing to which waking dreaming and deep sleep are appearing and changing that one thing you are which is in and through those three but it is the subject you see descartes came very close um, we remember descartes for his uh, cogito ergo sum but i was reading his uh, meditations and in one place he says look we cannot be sure of the external world it can all be doubted but what i can be sure of that i the doubter i do exist and then he says but he makes a comment there very interesting he comes very close and then he misses it he says how strange the things which can be doubted the world about that i have clear knowledge the thing which cannot be doubted i myself about that i have no clear knowledge i cannot understand what or who or what is this thing called myself and he he just drops it there and he makes one or two comments why did he miss it just like the counter he was expecting consciousness of the self to be one more thing that's why so it's not an object 
of knowledge in that sense but it is that which makes all knowledge possible consciousness is not an object of knowledge but it's that which makes all knowledge possible it is the pure subject if you take this criterion this, this is very important that consciousness is not an object immediately you have a criterion first of all for defining consciousness padma pada the great disciple of adi shankara acharya he gives this definition of consciousness anidam chaitanyam consciousness is not this consciousness not this within quotes whatever you can designate as this is not consciousness is an object to consciousness world this world not consciousness this body not consciousness this thought emotion idea even this theorizing about consciousness not consciousness because these are objects too in this in this um, approach even the mind is not consciousness uh, be careful here i'm not saying that the mind is not conscious the mind is conscious but it is not consciousness it is illumined by consciousness and that's why we we say the mind is conscious but the mind is also an object this distinction this very clear distinction between consciousness of and mind this is not available right now at the present state of consciousness studies or even in the modern philosophy of mind and this leads to enormous complications i remember going through a number of papers in our assignments at at harvard university and um, the uh, endless discussion about this problem and that problem everywhere there is a very clear solution from us you don't even have to go to advaita even from sankhyan perspective and i kept feeling of raising my hand <laughs> but anyway is a point is this distinction between mind and consciousness is a very valuable contribution that advaita can make let me pose one question to modern neuroscientists why is it that you can replicate every activity of the mind in a machine memory computers have memory recognition uh, decision making um uh, control of you know, like like the organs so you can a computer can control a, a, a machine a robot um uh, intelligence creativity computers are now being creative they can translate language they can even compose things all of these can be replicated in machines and yet only one thing cannot be replicated so far there's no idea of how to do that and that is this first person experience david chalmers speaks about you see somebody asked oh, all this idea about a uh, subjective pure consciousness non objective what does it explain it explains the most enormous fact of our lives first person experience nothing else expe- uh, explains first person experience you could have a robot or a zombie do everything that you are doing even give a speech and sit like this without being conscious but consciousness the inner first person experience that comes only from consciousness not from the mind not from anything anything objective okay you yes uh, sankhya yoga all of them they agree uh most of the indian philosophies uh, of consciousness they agree consciousness is this uh, pure subject not an object um i'll just mention one colloquium i attended at nyu in the philosophy department a couple of years ago at least three of the leading philosophers of mind including ned block um two or three others they, they were present there and the whole discussion was that why we cannot get a grasp on mind forget consciousness on mind itself and the conclusion they came to was see the whole methodology that we have taken up in science and even up to psychology uh, and obviously in brain science is that the st- study of an object an objectivity is a value subjectivity is a disvalue but the moment you are studying the subject itself then this whole process becomes an obstruction rather than a help um, you cannot eliminate the subject from a study of the subject <laughs> so that was a uh, conclusion they reached that is the third step that consciousness is not an object yes. then um you know many things about pure consciousness for example uh, i i read a paper which talks about pure consciousness events a misnomer if you moment you say event it means it is a beginning and an end that it is observable a pure consciousness event is is uh, is a conflation of two things the subjective and the objective um at this point i i can 
imagine, not even imagine, Christoph Koch actually said this to me. He said that, but if you do this, we cannot study consciousness. If you make it a pure uh, um, a subject and not an object, how do you study something that's a pure subject? Now, it does not eliminate neuroscience as a uh, field for studying consciousness, not at all. Because from an Advaitic perspective, this pure subject, the pure consciousness, which is non-objective, it, in, it is reflected in the mind, what we call the subtle body, sukshma sharira. And that is, that is entirely, uh, we can study it because that has a very close link with the, uh, with the brain. A, a rough, not so good analogy would be software and hardware. Suppose you have no access to the software. But if you study minutely what's happening in the circuitry of a computer when the software is working, you can trace out the algorithms. You can trace out what's happening in the software, uh, what the programming is like by tracing the activity in the circuits of a computer. So that's a kind of uh, rough analogy. It will not kill the uh, study of consciousness through neuroscience. Rather, uh, it will give a better perspective. All right. Moving on. The fourth the fourth uh, stage, the fourth stage is this consciousness, which is independent of the body and mind, body and mind, which is not an object, which is the pure subject. How many of these are there? The uh, instinctive reaction is to say that everybody, uh, every one of us, there are more than 100 of us here. So there are 100 consciousnesses here. Now, the Advaitic perspective, at this point, we, we are going to let go of just about every other philosophy. Not only modern thought, but also Sankhya and Yoga, they all agree that there are many consciousnesses. But Advaita Vedanta says there is only one consciousness. Consciousness is one unit. It is one consciousness shining through hundreds of um, millions of minds and bodies. Why would you say that? Um, Sankhya opposes Advaita at this point. Uh, Advaita reverses the question. Why do you say that there are many consciousnesses? It is clear why you would claim there are many bodies. Because here you can count. There are a hundred. The computer itself is telling us there are a hundred people in the meeting. They're counting the presence of hundred bodies. You could also um, argue that there are a hundred minds here. Because if you uh, ask people, take a survey, they'll give different replies to the same questions. There are different kinds of thoughts going on, different experiences. So bodies and minds are clearly different. But why would you say consciousness is different in each, each uh, entity? Sankhyans give good arguments, about five, four or five arguments for Bahupurusha. That means many consciousnesses. Uh, but those arguments are also easily dismissed. I'll give you one or two arguments and then we'll move on to the last uh, point. For example, the Sankhyans say there are many consciousnesses because if there's one consciousness, then the birth of one person would be the birth of everybody. The death of one person would be the death of everybody. That's not a good argument because birth and death are related to the body. The body is born and the body dies. Who says that consciousness is born with the birth of the body? Who says consciousness dies with the death of the body? There is uh, So that doesn't work. The Sankhyan comes back and says, well, um, how about this? Um, enlightenment, what we are all trying to look for. So if one being is enlightened, my guru is enlightened, then everybody else would be enlightened. If one being is in ignorance, everybody would be in ignorance because if you say there's one consciousness, but no, there's separate consciousnesses. That might seem like a tough one, but Advaita says it's, it's pretty easy to answer. Enlightenment, ignorance, bondage, freedom, they're all in the mind. Consciousness in itself is not subject to ignorance, nor does it need enlightenment. So minds are different. We admit it. Some minds may be enlightened, like your guru's mind, and uh, my mind might be ignorant. But that does not mean consciousness is in ignorance or consciousness needs enlightenment. So it goes on. About five major objections. Um, so we have reached fairly stratospheric levels where we have left most of uh, modern thought behind most philosophies of the world. Even Sankhya is left behind. Only Advaita with its uh, Upanishadic grounding is what I'm talking about. One more step remains to reach the Advaitic understanding of consciousness, the fifth step, which fifth step. So what do we have now? We have one all-pervading consciousness, which is purely subject. I'm not saying subjective, but subject, 
not an object. It is only one in all beings. Now, uh, the question is raised, what is the relationship between consciousness and everything else? So you have right now consciousness and the entire material universe. And quasars and quarks and living beings and non-living beings, planets and whales and oceans, all of that. What is the relationship between consciousness and the material universe? There are, for example, in Indian philosophy, there are four major approaches. One would be the materialistic approach, where we say that matter produces consciousness. So that's the reductionist approach. That's where, see, even Christoph Koch would say that, that uh, matter and consciousness they are deep, at least intimately related. Um, that's the materialistic approach. From the ancient Indian charvakas down to modern in, in integrated information theory, it is matter of some variation of matter which produces some process which produces consciousness. One theory. Second theory. Consciousness produces the material universe. Who says that? In fact, all the theistic religions of the world say it. All religions of the world say it, those who believe in God, because a common definition of God across all theistic religions, is God is the creator of the universe. Now put it in consciousness language, consciousness is the creator of matter. So that's the second theory. None of this is Advaita. The third theory would be neither creates the other. Uh, consciousness and the material universe are both fundamental realities, a lot like the panpsychism of David Chalmers. It is, um, this is the Sankhyan theory of Prakriti and Purusha. Consciousness and matter, both are real, both interact. Uh, so that's the third theory. There are others, I'm not bringing in other theories. Let's go straight to the Advaita theory and then I'll stop. The Advaitic approach to consciousness and matter is, matter is an appearance in consciousness. Matter is the material universe is nothing separate from consciousness. Consciousness is not only all pervasive, it is all that there is. Matter appears in consciousness to consciousness. It is not a second reality apart from consciousness. So consciousness is non-dual. No second thing apart from consciousness. Note, if you followed me carefully, immediately a question will come. Did you not say all throughout was your endeavor not to show that consciousness is separate from matter? You see, consciousness is separate from matter. True. But here's the subtle question. Advaita says consciousness is separate from matter uh, because consciousness is not this. Matter is this, phenomenologically speaking. So consciousness is separate from matter. But the question we should ask is, is matter separate from consciousness? Is matter separate from consciousness? What kind of question is this? What does this mean? See, there are two kinds of separation. This uh, piece of paper and this pen, they're separate. Pen is separate from paper, paper is separate from pen. Correct. But when you come to something like clay and pot, the classic Vedantic uh, Upanishadic example, clay is not the pot, but the pot is nothing other than clay. What do I mean? The clay can be a lump of clay. It was before it became a pot. Once the pot is broken, it can be pot sherds. It's no longer a pot, but it's still clay. It was clay to begin with. It was clay when you called it a pot. It's clay when you can no longer call it a pot. It's something else. Clay is not the same thing as pot. Pot is a name and a form and a function imposed on clay temporarily. But the pot is nothing other than the clay. The pot cannot exist for a minute, for a, for a second, without its constitutive, constitutive substance, which is clay. Similarly, another good example is our dreams. You are not your dreams. You are independent. You can exist without anything that you saw in the dream. You do exist. You wake up from a dream. But your dreams are nothing. Your dreams are nothing apart from you. They do not exist for a moment when you wake up. They disappear if you do not support it. Similarly, the entire material order, according to Advaita Vedanta, is imposed. The Sanskrit word is um, adhyasa. It's an appearance. You can put it this way. The universe is the dream of consciousness. Okay, I think I'm done. I'll sum up in one sentence. What did I do? Or two sentences. From the latest theories of uh, neuroscience on consciousness, from their latest consciousness theories, up to the Advaitic understanding of consciousness, how do you get there? A root map. What are the major steps you take? So the first, you start off with something like the integrated information theory of uh, Tononi or Christoph Koch. 
which I gather is a leading contender uh, among the neuroscience theories of consciousness today. And you see certain features which Advaita would be happy with, that consciousness is everywhere, that consciousness is immensely valuable, unparalleled value, that consciousness is it's life-changing, it's your investigation of consciousness. These are things you would agree with. But then you ask the second stage, ask the hard question about the hard problem of consciousness. So consciousness is, uh, Advaita would say, and the hard problem is a genuine problem. Consciousness cannot be reduced to matter. It's, it's independent. Then you go to the third step where you say consciousness is not an object. It is an entirely different thing. The pure subject. That's the idea of pure consciousness. A Chaitanya in, in, in Advaita Vedanta. From the third step, you go to the fourth one. How many such pure consciousnesses are there? There's only one, according to Advaita Vedanta. And then you go to the last, the fifth um, step, where you reduce the entire material universe back into consciousness. That it, um, this universe is nothing apart from consciousness. Note that if you take the Advaitic perspective, which sounds so crazy, so widely different from what we are used to, uh, we think of this material universe as the solid reality in which consciousness is just a spark, like a you know, like an epiphenomenon. Advaita reverses this. Consciousness is the solid reality. It is the only reality that we can ever be certain of. And uh, matter, for an Advaitin, the material universe is obviously an appearance in consciousness. Just, just the statement of what we experience. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much. Okay, Maharaj, thank you very much for your enlightening and kind of like a roadmap. Uh, and also thanks to everyone for kind of kind of placing your questions, kind of, I mean, within this limited time, it, it kind of naturally we cannot cover all your questions. So I have to, I have to choose a bit of kind of randomly, but, but before I, I start kind of posing your questions, uh, because I'm also a neuroscientist kind of by profession. So I it kind of, I have to rescue a bit of the field and of which more kind of rightfully say that yes, most of the studies are primarily a kind of correlational. However, uh, we have to say that still there is a quite kind of extensive research going on how to establish more of a causal kind of relationship between certain brain response and patterns of brain responses and at certain experience. So in a, in, it kind of, it kind of in order to advance from just to observe a correlated kind of activities than to, to make a cause and effect relationship, that's usually the cornerstone of science. And also regarding, I know that this is this hard problems, this plagued the consciousness research for very many years. But personally, I think, and also there is a good body of scientific kind of empirical scientists also believe this is, uh, we just got stuck with the language. Hard problems, it is just a mapping. This, this is because one hand we experience something and other hand we can measure something, whether it's a brain or behavior or something else. So hard problem is kind of nothing but how can we map so one information is that we often quite subjective experience and other which is that we can measure. And modern science actually, even including the neuroscience, there is a very good body of research which documents the map, kind of map. Yes, we are not yet there yet in terms of establishing a very causal kind of relationship yet. So yes, as kind of, as I already mentioned, it was mainly correlated, but uh, I think this is, uh, we often say this problem we cannot resolve. I don't think that's a right one. This is a philosophical kind of kind of stuck with the languages. And with all respect to the philosophers, I only can paraphrase, I think Francis Crick said once regarding consciousness research, because he was the one who kind of revolutionized the recent consciousness research. He said, kind of regarding the philosophers, listen to their questions, but not to their answers. Hmm. So uh, in a sense, I mean, and also I have to say that kind of, I'm not saying neuroscience would resolve the problem because there is, I also, as a neuroscientist, I also have problems uh, kind of accepting the fundamental premise of the most of the neuroscientists that we believe that consciousness is a product of the brain. However, in terms of defense of the neuroscience, I have to say this is neuroscience only working on the consciousness out for the last 30 years. 
and and still within this very limited span, we have a very good understanding of of in that sense is to relate kind of patterns of the brain activities in terms of neurophysiology and also how we understand in terms of our suffering, pain, joy, and so forth. Of course, we are not there yet. We means the scientific community to have this very precise relationship because the one of the major problems that scientists face is we kind of boggle what is, how can we define the consciousness? And that's where one of the major problem, and unless we have a very clear definition, science struggles. Unless there is a very clear definition, which is accepted by everybody, irrespective of whatever the limitation definitions. And that's where I believe one of the problems of, of, of our empirical approach towards the consciousness. And also it's a kind of a mysterious in a sense, because if you consider key questions, so, for example, if you ask, is consciousness essential to our behavior? You can get answer on both sides. Or also, if you ask, what are the, for example, evidences of, of consciousness that we can detect from outside? There also, you do not have very clear answer. So anyway, so we kind of, I will just start with a question, which is also kind of the question also posed either Samis, because it says now the science have developed quite a bit to replicate intelligence, creativity, but still so far we, at least uh, we possibly could not kind of induce consciousness in the machine. And, and actually I also thought about that and we have a attendant who asked, how can we be certain that if a machine might have consciousness, but we have no way to find out? So how can we be confident that a machine or a computer does not have the consciousness? Because if we as assume that it is a very much a subjective, then there is no way from that point of view that I can be confidently certain that a machine doesn't have the consciousness. Now, that's a difficult one. I am reminded of... Uh... Roger Penrose is in the beginning to his uh, book, I think The Emperor's New Mind, perhaps. He got the Nobel Prize uh, recently, of course, not for his theories of consciousness. Um, but at the beginning of the book, he talks about uh, like, an, uh, like a thought experiment, this super powerful computer, um, which can answer all questions. And then this little boy steps up to the computer and asks, well, Mr. Computer, how, what does it feel like to be a computer? And the computer crashes. Now, I thought, a simple way to, to, if you have a like a very intelligent computer, which can interact with you, which can replicate um, just about every bit of human behavior, then you could just ask it, are you conscious? Assuming it wouldn't lie, it would have to say no. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, if it says yes, then you have to think well, what's going on there. Anyway, um, note, that in philosophy, this is precisely the problem of other minds. How, forget consciousness. How do you even know that uh, other people have minds? It's only by extension of our own uh, experience that this person looks like me, talks like me, uh, has expressions like me, so probably has feelings, thoughts, and emotions like me. I do not have any access to your thoughts. Uh, um, so consciousness is one step behind, is uh, deeper than that. Consciousness is that which reveals my thoughts to me. Even thoughts are objective from a Vedantic perspective. So you asked about the definition of consciousness. I'm reminded of a friend of mine who's actually a mathematician, Mohan Maharaj. Uh, he's a, a, a topologist. One day he was very dismissive about the whole field of, of consciousness studies. I asked why. He said, because it's not a mature field. You don't have a definition of what you are studying. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, there's a very clear definition. Like I get, but it's a very phenomenological definition, an inside out definition. The definition of consciousness is not this. So whatever in your experience is this, you can correct this, label as this, it's not consciousness. It's an object to consciousness. Anyway, so how do you know if a machine is conscious? How do you know that a machine has a mind? How do you know that um, anybody has a mind? We don't know, really. Um, in fact, the only place, the only consciousness that you can ever be sure of is your own consciousness. Not even the consciousness of others. That's the whole philosophical uh, you know, thought experiment of zombies. That you can have a person who is exactly like, like you, who does everything like a living being, uh, and yet inside there's nothing going on. 
it's blank inside. Um, then how would you know that the person is uh, has even a mind, thoughts, feelings, let alone consciousness? Um, what a better question would be. So from your Advaitic perspective, what is involved in making something conscious? We admit that suppose there is something called pure consciousness. Fine. But what's going on here in this body-mind? So the Advaita has a three-tier understanding of this. Consciousness, mind, body. Now, mind and body, uh, there, it, there is uh, sufficient grounds for treating them differently. Why? Again, in your own experience. Notice, when you look at yourself, when you, when you consider yourself, you see two distinctly different sides to yourself. One is, um, as Sarva and as this body, it's a public data. The doctor can examine the body. In fact, the doctor can know much more about my body than I can. It's visible to all of you. So that's one side of me, the physical body. But there's also something else going on inside. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, what I consider the person Sarva Priyananda to be. This is entirely first person and private to each of us. So it is logical to say that this is a separate entity, deeply connected with the body, no doubt, but distinctly different because I, I experience it. I cannot deny that I have a mind, that I have thoughts, feelings, emotions. Now, the question is, what are those thoughts, feelings, emotions? Can you reduce them to the body, to the brain or not? But uh, as far as the data goes, the data available to you, you have to treat these as distinct entities and at least with distinctly different properties, body-mind. And that to which the body-mind is appearing, that is called consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. Consciousness, mind, body. Now, in between consciousness and the body is the mind. In Vedanta, this is called the Sukshma Sharira. The subtle body. If, now in principle, Vedanta considers this subtle body to be an object also. So if objects, what is object to Vedanta is part of our material universe, Vedanta would consider even the mind to be part of the material universe. So in one sense, in principle, Vedanta is actually fully in sympathy with the uh, aims, objectives and approach of modern neuroscience. Modern neuroscience would say that all of it is at the, at the end material. And Vedanta would say, yes, body is material. Uh, mind is also material. So that's a place where uh, one can investigate. Can we discover a modern scientific approach to the mind, um, leaving consciousness aside for the time being? Uh, if you can do that, if you can generate a mind for a machine, in Vedantic terms, a subtle body, then that machine would, would become conscious. It is mind which reflects consciousness in, in, in the Vedantic terms, even Sankhya and cosmology. So this, and this mind is supposed to be material. Now, I don't know how that would map into modern science. That is something that's still open. In fact, my feeling is as neuroscience develops and as physics develops, Roger Penrose had a very physics and neuroscience kind of combination for his theory of consciousness. He said something of what quantum fluctuations and the microtubules in the brain. I don't understand any of it. But the, the, uh, the idea is that if the mind is something material at the end of it, it is something that is yet to be discovered. And yet it is discoverable by, entirely by scientific investigation. So that's the route which we can take, I think. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. I, kind of, I'd like to probe a bit further on this aspect, the, the potential distinctions or the or also the relationship between mind slash self and consciousness. For example, the recent neuroscience says that, especially for example, if if one consumes, for example, this this kind of mind altering drugs, this yeah. kind of psilocybin, even in a small dose, then then in terms of experientially, persons kind of loses a bit of self because they're the self. This conception almost dissolved. However, at the same time, the consciousness kind of remains quite intact. So yes. what do you, kind of how can you kind of this relate this kind of aspect of consciousness as well as this, this kind of construct of, of self? Excellent, excellent question. And in fact, I forgot to mention, Christoph Koch actually spoke about that. Uh, the, that the drug you mentioned, uh, psilo, uh, what is the name of the drug? Psilocybin, psilocybin. Psilocybin, yes. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know if he actually took it, but he said he had extraordinary experiences, which, which can be called mystical uh, experiences. And he was, he was taking it very, very seriously. 
Although he is very clear that those mystical experiences do not prove anything except that it's possible to induce that in a brain through a drug. Now, the question of mind self consciousness. This is crucial to Advaita Vedanta or Sankhya. In fact, most of the Indian philosophies investigate this alone. What is the self? That was the original question in Indian philosophy, which, which brought them to the question of mind and consciousness. Here is the answer from the, from the Advaitic perspective. We normally take ourselves to be body-mind. When I say, who am I? I uh, instinctively refer to this. This, I am this. And when you ask, what is this? I, I would say, this is me. So I, the self, is something that is identified with the body. And the body is something that is identified with the self. This is Shankara, Shankara's famous Anyonya a mutual superimposition. This is our normal state. This is what we understand ourselves to be. And all that Advaita claims is, upon investigation, this is found to be false. The self is, which is taken to be the body-mind, especially the mind. We take this inner person to be ourselves. The Sarva Priyananda person. This is who I am. Advaita Vedanta says, no. You are essentially not a person. You are not essentially the mind also. You are essentially consciousness. So consciousness and mind are distinct. What distinguishes them? This knife edge of subject and object. Anything that you just take this one knife to distinguish. This operating um, procedure would be whatever is an object in your first person experience is an object. It's not the subject. It's not you. It's not the self. So is the mind an object? Am I aware of my thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, understanding, comprehension, lack of comprehension, memory, lack of recall, uh, desires? Yes. If I'm aware of them, then they are not me. They are not the self. They are an object to the self. Then what constitutes the self? The Advaitic answer is consciousness alone constitutes the self. And that consciousness is not an object. So this is the distinction. Thank you, Swamiji. Well, in the same line, actually, there is a question posed by Rishi Dev. He said, if the idea of consciousness arises from the duality of subject and object, can it be that the phenomenon of consciousness is an emergent property from the structure of human language? Um, can it be that the phenomenon of consciousness is an emergent property of the structure of human language? Uh, that is one approach that has been taken at one time, especially this was, again, the philosophers. So at one time, this was in fashion, in what was called the Oxford, um, the, the, the ordinary language uh, philosoph philosophers, Austin and others. So following that, Gilbert Ryle, for example. So following that, they tried to see um, consciousness. See, they don't distinguish between mind and consciousness. So they'll talk indistinguishably about mind and consciousness, reducing mind to language. Um, Gilbert Ryle's uh, very dialectical uh, uh, book, The Concept of Mind. So there he tries to show that the mind is nothing other than uh, an illusion set up by language, for example. I do not think so. See, you just, just apply um, the... That, that same operating principle is language an object that appears to consciousness. Obviously it is. You are aware of language. Language is not aware of you. Um, just say the word language. Who was aware of this word? You are aware. Consciousness is aware of, of language. Language is not aware of consciousness. So consciousness objectifies language. And language cannot objectify consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is not a product. It's a very elegant way of looking at it, but a very um, it can make people very, very uncomfortable. But I, mean, I just want to show how radical Advaita actually is. Yes. So no, my answer is absolutely not. It doesn't work. As I was saying, the whole field of the philosophy of language, uh, of, of the philosophy of mind, one of the attempts uh, of reducing consciousness to something, either brain or behavior or language. So one attempt was to reduce it to language. Again, it fails. Okay, kind of in terms of extending into a little bit of kind of further play with the language, actually, Balam asked, so there are three states of mind, conscious, subconscious, and, and super conscious. So kind of, and does that mean that does consciousness include all of them or only the conscious mind? Ah, 
notice conscious mind subconscious mind super conscious mind whatever you're calling it these are all states of the mind not of consciousness a question is asked that you see this consciousness is one unchanging how is it that sometimes i feel more conscious you know after a cup of coffee i feel more conscious when i'm drowsy and bored uh, i feel less conscious and when i fall asleep i seem to lose consciousness how are you saying consciousness is unchanging so the answer from an advaitic perspective is that uh, these are states of the mind waking dreaming deep sleep these states of the mind not of consciousness so from an advaitic perspective consciousness neither increases nor decreases it reveals the changing states of the mind but as the mind changes you know in sankhyan terms more sattvic less sattvic it seems to reflect better reflect less hence we feel more conscious more alert uh, or less conscious or so when you take a little bit of uh, this uh, psilocybin uh, you it's the mind it's it affects the mind why does it affect the mind because it's a drug which goes through the body and the body is connected with the mind very deeply so i mean you don't have to go to mind altering drugs take a cup of coffee that changes the mind and the mind affects the body also because uh, psychosomatic diseases for example so mind and body are very closely linked but consciousness is that which is reflected in channeled through the mind um, so all these this talk about states of consciousness changes in consciousness from an advaitic perspective and even sankhyan perspective these are changes in mind and would can in principle be traced back to changes in the brain yeah so that's another clue yeah that's right, yeah. That's right mara i mean regarding the psilocybin studies i think the one of the implication at least for the empirical science is a primarily the potential separations between the self which at least the scientific kind of data wise it could be could be considered more as an illusory constructions where the consciousness that could be more considered more fundamental because even after the drug we also have this kind of kind of correlated kind of neural evidence when when this this kind of construction of self dissolves but still this experiential consciousness kind of retains and it is supported by similar neural activation patterns when we perf- for example when we are usually kind of engaged in terms of daydreaming there are specific brain regions get activated and the same brain regions get very strongly deactivated under psilocybin so that shows that very likely that there's a kind of the brain activity patterns that are goes hand in hand with this construction of self when we lose this construction of self so the very similar brain regions get deactivated while at the same time we still maintain this our conscious experiential consciousness so that's implication is could be that this this ex, this kind of construction of self it it has a more of an illusory substrate where the consciousness that possibly more of a fundamental that is much more difficult to get rid of as compared to as a construction of self in fact so that's the kind of initial implications of yes of this research uh, but acharya i mean if i was listening very carefully to what you said is excellent point this is a this is one take away we could you know from this entire webinar today i see here in what you said neuro the neuroscience of consciousness buddhism and advaita vedanta coming together you see uh, with with uh, you know verified from neuroscience studies um, under the effect of that drug what happens is as you said the construction of the self falls apart now this constructed self is what advaita vedanta calls the false self it is not real actually what buddhism says not self anatma so when uh, under the impact of that drug the construction of the self falls apart this is what buddhism would say the self is is empty there is it is not a reality in itself and advaita vedanta would say see this is what i said that's not the real self the real self is as you said consciousness is still there uh, that the new m- mind expanded um, the constructed self has dissolved that's also an experience that means consciousness is still there so the consciousness is the real self and uh, this the self which we normally are accustomed to that's a construct advaita vedanta agrees with you buddhism agrees with you and the neuroscience of consciousness agree uh, agrees with this that's excellent okay brilliant because i'm kind of mindful about the time so this is the last question which is also kind of kind of very fundamental so this is this is placed by david so so he asked how do we apply 
this, this non-dual Vedanta to our lives? In other words, how does this particular view of consciousness affect how we live? Or to put it in another way, how do we translate it into wisdom? Because that's what, what's it, all it matters. Right. It has tremendous um, implications for our life. That's why I was so happy to hear when Christoph Koch said that my investigations into consciousness, you know, they have really changed my life. Uh, I cannot now kill even an insect. So all of these, this impact on his life. When you investigate this and you find that you are consciousness itself, which cannot be killed. Uh, so according to Advaita Vedanta, uh, it, it is not born with the birth of the body. It does not die with the death of the body. You are this immortal, unchangeable awareness. Then you are safe from old age, disease, and death. They will still continue, but they affect the body. You are free of fear. If this entire universe is an appearance within you, what do you need from this? You are all of it in one sense. All of this universe is nothing but you in another form appearing to you. It's more like an aesthetic experience for you, an experience of yourself. So you are ever fulfilled, unlimited by time, unlimited by space, ever fulfilled. You will be fearless. You will be uh, uh, ever content and happy. You will feel a oneness, very important. You feel a oneness with everybody, which Christoph Koch, even at the level of say, integrated information theory, as consciousness, we feel a oneness with all conscious beings. All beings have consciousness. So we feel a oneness with them. Advaita Vedanta says, it's not just a oneness. It's actually an ontological fact that you are one or the universe is one with you. We are one existence, one awareness. I can't put it any better than Swami Vivekananda. He said, the essence of Vedanta teaching says, the divinity within ourselves, by which he uh, means this, this, uh, the real consciousness within ourselves, and the oneness of all existence. Notice, all of ethics can be grounded here. So the big question of, why should I be good to you? Swami Vivekananda puts it this way. If it profits me to cut my neighbor's throat, why should I love my neighbor and be good to my neighbor? Because... Advaita answers, because you and your neighbor are one. You are one because you would never dream of harming yourself. You would not dream of harming anybody else. The neighbor, your, the, all human beings, all living beings, the entire uh, community of life is one reality, even what we consider non-living. Uh, so tremendous imp uh, implications of Advaita Vedanta. It revolutionizes your life. Uh, as Vivekananda said, it divinizes your life. It sets you free. So the understanding of consciousness in this sense is very liberating. It's a, it gives you a wonderful philosophy of life. Thank you, Samiji. I think I'll hand it over to Orpita if, if you want to conclude. Uh, thank you so much, Nivedh uh, Maharaj and uh, Professor Bhattacharya for this wonderful session. Although Many questions could not be answered, but I feel whatever has been discussed here will be of uh, great uh, interest and use to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I now hand over the mic to Amrita. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maharajji, and thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for such an enlightening uh, talk and session. Now I request Ms. Alka to propose the vote of thanks and also to make announcements about the upcoming uh, events. So Alka, over to you. Oh, thank you, Didi. Um, on behalf of VSC JNU, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our speaker, Swami Sarpriyananda Ji, for enlightening us in today's session on the science of consciousness. We are deeply thankful to Professor Joyadi for sharing the session. We were grateful to have you, sir, in today's session. Our thanks to all our VSC JNU members, Prachi Siddhi, Amrita Didi, Arun sir, Priya ma'am, Shrikha Didi, Tanushri Didi, Rishi, um, Shilpa, Namrata Didi, for their constant inputs and suggestions. Um, our special thanks to Prachi Didi for chanting Shanti Mantra. I extend my special thanks to Dr. Uh, Arpita Mitra for coordinating with the speaker, for managing the invitations and um, in coordinating with the participants. I would like to thank Professor Anirban Chakravarti, president of our BSC JNU, for his incessant support, 
for his technical assistance and all the guidance. I extend my special thanks to Swagata Didi and Hirdesh sir for their technical support in managing the VSE gym. Our thanks to all the participants who took their time in joining today's talk and bringing it to success. We look forward to organize more talks like this. Before bringing today's talk, uh, it's closing. Here is an announcement. So the next VSC talk is on the secret of non-attachment by Revit Swami um, Sudhinanji. The dates will be announced accordingly uh, in uh, shortly. Those who wish to re uh, receive invitations to our events may please uh, drop a line to vscjnu um, at the red gmail.com. For our next talk, like uh, from the next talk, we'll be giving the link of the Google form that you can fill for the line of confirmation. Thank you. Um, now I'll uh, request Prachititi to conclude this session with the Santi Mantra. Thank you, Alka. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and namaste to everybody. Take care. Be safe. Thank you, Maharaj.